All right, everybody, what a basketball weekend. The final four in the NBA is set. We know that the Celtics are going to be taking on the Indiana Pacers, the Nuggets, and T-Wolves. Sheesh, what a game seven that was. We'll talk about that. And we got our guy, the Chiefs here, Kari Thompson from Boston.com. He's rocking with us today, so let's stop messing around. Scream with Envy. Let's lock in. What up, what up, what up? Welcome into another edition of Green with Envy. As always, this is your boy, Will Weir, checking in. How you doing? How you living? Joining us today is first up, my best friend, co-host, and the coach of our podcast, the one and only, Greg Menakis. Greg, did you enjoy the basketball this weekend? Some great basketball this weekend. I cannot wait to talk about the Game 7s. Uh, some upsets, upsets in Game 7s, but we got my guy with us here today, Kari Thompson. The chief, the jump rope king is in the house. Uh, for those of you that don't know the backstory between me and Kari, I used to be Kari's coach, basketball coach back in the day. And I've seen his rise throughout the, the media world. And I'm so excited to have you on today, Kari. Well, tonight, Kari, how you doing, man? I appreciate that, Greg, man. It's great to be on with you and Will. Always a fun time. Um, I remember the early days of Green with Envy, and you guys have come a long, long way. So big <laughs> fan of the show. Keep it up. Thanks yeah, for having me. To be fair, you were actually, I think, the original part of well, before it was even called Green with Envy. How mm -hmm. did you did you did you did you what'd you call it, Greg, for that first episode? Because it was you and Kari that recorded the very first episode. Was there even a name at that point? Dude, I have no idea. <laughs> right? Dude, it's have, such a good trivia question. We don't even know the answer to it. Right. <laughs> that was back in the day. That was when uh Everybody was just trying to pass the time during the pandemic. And um, I hit up my guy, Kari, and we, I think we talked about maybe James Wiseman. We did talk James about James Wiseman. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. Mm -hmm. And you Good mentioned, uh, I remember you were talking about Precious Achua a little bit. Yep. Yeah, that was, that was probably four years ago now at this point. Man, yeah, time flies. But here we are. Uh, it's 2024. Kari Thompson is now killing it in the Boston media game all the way from the Memphis commercial appeal. Now he's doing big things for Boston.com, covering all the all the teams and covering the Boston Celtics. So we're really excited to have Kari um, be part of the show. Kari is going to be coming on every once in a while throughout the year, anytime he can fit us into his busy schedule. So thanks for being here, man. Oh, no problem, man. Anytime. You know I got you. Yeah, so let's get into it, guys, here. So we got a couple of things that we're going to hit. Obviously, we're going to spend a bulk of this episode uh, in a little bit here talking about the Pacers and Celtics. That is your Eastern Conference Finals, just like everybody predicted. From the in-season tournament to the West to the Eastern Conference Finals, Pacers-Celtics, we will talk all about that, give you all the breakdowns. But let's start just with the Game 7s today, guys, because there's nothing better than Game 7s in sports. We're all sports fans beyond just being basketball fans. We're all sports fans, right? We grew up in Boston. This is what we live for. So when there's game sevens going on, you know, we try to lock in as much as we can. Kari, I know that you were, uh, you're with some family for your, your sister's graduation tomorrow. Shout out to your sister graduating thank college, you, by you. the way. Uh, but let's, let's start with the most recent game, which was the Nuggets and T-Wolves, which was incredibly dramatic. But let's start here, Kari. What, what's the last part? Because I know we were just talking off air before we started recording that you were at a family dinner so you can get a chance to watch all of it. So I want Greg and I to actually walk you through what our men mental mind state was for this game let's because go. we got to try and give you the full vibe of it because it was pretty crazy. All right, let's go. Where would you leave okay. off with this game? Um, so basically, I kind of – I just caught bits and pieces of the action throughout the day. So basically – my flight was during the first game seven. Um, so that was actually nice. So I could sit down and watch the first half of that Knicks Pacers game. Um, and I was like, dang, the Knicks are getting smacked. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and then we had dinner and then dinner was, um, was during the second game. And, uh, you know, I was trying my best to kind of crane my head over the table and steal some glances because it was on both TVs, like right <laughs> over my head. But like, you know, people were caught up in conversation and stuff like that. So I was kind of like in and out, you know, catching the action. So what was well, the let's last start thing? With you, what was the, okay, I just want to ask, Kari, what was the last thing you actually saw on the TV? Uh, it was about, it, it was it was when, it was in Minnesota pulled ahead. Because, um, you know, they were down pretty much the whole game. 
Yep. And, uh, you know, it was those final two minutes and we kind of looked up like, how did Minnesota <laughs> come back? You know, how do they, how do they win? Yeah, I guess that's where we, we can kind of fill you in. So, I mean, in the first half, that was just Jokic and Murray masterclass, right? Jokic had 15 boards at the half. He was dominating inside as Jokic does. Uh, Jamal Murray was cooking, but it seemed like to me, they really kind of blew their load in the first half. Like they didn't have anything in the second half. And as he said in his post game, he took the Jamal Murray assignment fully in the second half and really took him out of the game. Uh, Ant did not play well on at scoring the ball. He he was a little passive, but I think he really turned it on in the second half and made all the plays that he needed to make. Um, you know, a couple of big steals, transition dunks, good passes out to the corner for for corner shooters. And I think for the Nuggets, what I was talking with Will about and texting with him about is nobody else on the Nuggets stepped up. Not one person stepped up. Michael Porter Jr., complete dud. KCP, complete dud. Aaron Gordon, after having a great first half of the series, did absolutely nothing in this Five game. Five shots tonight for Aaron Gordon. Five shots total. Can't Ouch. have it. Yikes. Can't have it. And, and the thing was, Greg, about that, just and apologies for, for jumping in here, but like yeah. this is the team that just won the championship. All those role guys look shook in this game, right? You're at home. You're the defending champs. You got game seven in your building and you have the altitude. That's the added part of the home element for, for the nuggets. And to your point, Greg, they look gassed and all of their role players completely shrunk in this moment. And that's why to me, I don't even know if I was more shocked at the nuggets kind of shriveling in the moment outside of their, their big two, because their continuity and their chemistry is part of what may, has made them so great over the last you know two seasons as a team. Or was it the T wolves who felt like they were kind of dead up until, you know, towards the end of the second half to the end, towards the end of the first half. And then they somehow as a young team picked themselves up off the mat and got them to this point. But I think ultimately, Kari, what we should have known is I think in the uh, in the fourth quarter with maybe about seven minutes left or maybe six minutes, I think about seven minutes left, Rudy Gobert hit a fadeaway jump shot at the end as the shot clock buzzer went off. Once that happens, you just know something's on your sure. side. If Rudy Gobert is hitting a fadeaway jump shot, and I think that was kind of the that, that was the end of it right there when something like that happens. Rudy with the fade. All right. Can we talk about the tale of two halves for Anthony Edwards? Because when I was watching this about, you know, very late into the second quarter, Ant was like one for six. He had like four points. Obviously, that changed at the end. It was probably a big part of why they won. Yeah, I think with Ant, the, the thing that really Im impresses me about him is just like his overall poise. It's a word he used in his post game on the court. He's also just like filled with so much joy and exuberance yeah. every every time he's he sees like a, a microphone in front of him or a camera in front of him he's like it's my time to shine i'm the coolest dude in the room i'm gonna let you know about it and charles barkley said to him he was like and let me let me tell you something i haven't been to minnesota in 20 years and Ant just interrupts and he goes bring your ass <laughs> <laughs> He just starts talking shit. That's what I love about Ant because in the first half, he really seemed completely thrown off by the double teams because they said, we are going to make you pass the ball. There's no way you're, you're either going to force shots or you're going to have to trust your teammates and pass the ball. And that's what he did throughout the entire night. He really didn't force anything um, where there were times where I felt like he, he probably needed to because guys weren't hitting shots initially and then they ended up hitting shots in the end. But to me, what stands out the most about Ant is just like his unwavering confidence in himself and his teammates. And that's, that's why I think he's special. You know, he obviously has all the talent in the world, but I think the reason why so many people gravitate towards him and see him as the next great American hope is that he has that mindset that you, you kind of just have to have to trust your eyes when you see it. You know, because if, if you if you want to talk yourself out of it, sure, he has to prove himself. There were times tonight where, you know, we can talk about the Tatum comparisons or whatever. But, you know, when you see Anthony Edwards on the court that he's there for the business that night and it's not going to change. I think to your point, Greg, like trusting your eyes, this is this is kind of going into the Ant Jason Tatum debate, which I is kind of out there as a thing. It's not fully a thing, but it is kind of a thing. If you if you bring it up, people know what you're talking about. And I think this is the killer instinct, right? Which isn't there's no there's no stat for it. There's no you know metric that you can go find for it. It's kind of an eyes thing. And I'm certainly not saying that Jason Tatum doesn't have it, but I, I'm saying this is what I feel like 
I kind of get from the media a little bit. It's that mixed with, you know, Ant's going to be the guy out there, you know, talking shit and you know also that exuberance that comes along with it like ants just more demonstrative than than tatum is right and yeah. so i i think it's it's interesting when you look at that from like that ant jt perspective but you know like ant to have the game that he did today where he was i think six of 24 was his final stat line and for me it was the defense i mean he stripped Mar jamal Murray, kind of the way we saw you know jb his, you know, one of the guys that he looks up to in the league, the way that we saw him strip Jamal Murray, when we think back to the Celtics Nuggets game in Denver, that's kind of the mentality Ant took on at certain portions of this game to go pick up uh, Jamal Murray and make things happen on the defensive side. And for me, that's been the biggest change in watching Ant this season versus I think the last couple seasons is it was glimpses of him being good on defense. I think now it's, it's pretty scary when he's locked in on defense with all the other length and size that the T wolves have, and that it really has taken the T wolves defense to a whole other level when ants also the one kind of leading that charge. Yeah, Car. I want to get your thoughts on the whole Tatum versus Ant thing here, but to to kind of piggyback off of what Will was saying before we go into your thoughts on that, he did say immediately in the post game as well when they asked him about Dallas, his first words were, "Well, they got Kyrie. That's my matchup." You know, so he he understands that his impact is not just on the offensive side of the ball. He understands that he is an elite two way player. But Kari, what are your thoughts on the whole Ant versus Tatum thing? I mean, they're at different stages in their career. Like Ant's a 22-year-old guy. And Tatum, you know, he's already been to five conference finals and an NBA final. So, you know, there, there has to be a lot more basketball to be played um, than that, you know, before we can fully get into that debate. But if you're talking about who's going to be the future, who's, who's the best American-born basketball player, um, I mean, obviously those are two names that come to mind. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Tatum's got the better team. Um, uh, for sure. Um, well, we might, we, we might find out on the court here in a couple of weeks. We'll have to well, see. We, we might, we might, but, but on paper, Tatum has a better team. Um, and, and, uh, he's, he's a little bit better on the boards, but I mean, and, and to me is very fun to watch. Like he's, he's just a very entertaining player. And like you said, he has the swag, he has the charisma, you know, he's got those highlight real dunks. Like that is what's very interesting. And, it, and it's funny a third name that I would throw in there, um, pre-gun incident, would be John Morant. <laughs> like yeah. John Morant is also very much in that ilk, and I feel like people, you know, kind of forgot about him with how bad the Grizzlies were and with his injuries last year. Yeah, no, I think you're totally right with that, and I think yeah, you're right. It, the, you made you make a great point. Ant and JT are in two separate phases of their career. I think for me, where I just get sometimes frustrated is it feels like. I mean, obviously, this is a big stepping stone towards where Anthony Edwards is going. But like you said, Tatum's lived in the Houston Conference Finals five out of the last seven years. He's slayed a lot of the other members of his generation, whether it's Embiid, Giannis, Jimmy, played KD in the playoffs multiple times. Like, I know the Celtics, oh, and we're going to get to the Celtics here with against the Pacers coming up here in just a minute. But, like, I know the Celtics are having an easy road this year to get to the Conference Finals, potentially back to the Finals. But let's not forget... The Celtics have been busting their ass the last several years. Yeah. Playoff round after playoff round against really tough opponents. This is the first break the Celtics have caught. And I think sometimes Jason Tatum is more viewed as like, man, he's just catching breaks with that team. And it's like, man, they've had to beat so many tough teams other than this specific postseason to get to where they're at. And he's continually kind of slayed those dragons. So I think because people have already insert, not everybody, obviously, but in certain areas, you can see that they're, they've put – Ant already above Tatum. I think that's where my personal frustration comes in is that Tatum just doesn't get enough credit where I don't think Ant deserves any more credit because like you said, he's 22. Like this is his first right. real time going deep in the in the playoffs. And certainly we're going to see how that plays out. And Luke is also another guy that falls into this kind of not from an American standpoint, but from that age of his career, Luke is kind of in between the Ant and Tatum timeline. And another point about Tatum that kind of goes into this debate, and it's not entirely his fault, but the Celtics have a really, really bad, annoying habit of playing down to their competition. And I think that certainly feeds into the perception because obviously JT is very consistent. He's consistent. He's durable. He's going to have his stats. He's going to get his, even if his jump shots not falling, he has a myriad of ways to affect the game, but like, you know, I think the narrative is will be a little bit different if we didn't have the Donovan Mitchell-less Cavs stealing games, 
the Jimmy Butlerless Heat stealing games, the Heat beating them last year, and, and when they had no business doing so. I mean, like you know, JT's had his moments. Don't get me wrong, but I think those games also contribute to that narrative. Yeah, I yeah. think that's definitely a fact. Uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely a fact. And I think we're going to have time to dig into this even more. But for now, I, I do want to transition us to get to what's actually coming next year. So let's, let's, let's talk about the other Game 7 that leads into where the Celtics are going. And we're going to circle back to the T-Wolves. We can have, add some more thoughts in here uh, later on in the show. But the other Game 7 today, Kari, I know you mentioned that first half, the – the Knicks just let's just be real. They ran out of players. They ran out of bodies. Yeah, I think everybody right. dating back to the Ewing Knicks ended up on the injury list. <laughs> the time we got done with the series, like they lit OG tried to give it a go. He was out there for about three minutes. Somehow he hit two shots in the first couple of minutes. He did, but he was so immobile. But shout out to him for trying. Shout out to all the Knicks. Like the Knicks, listen, that Knicks team was even being a Celtics fan was a fun team to watch and a fun team to root for. But ultimately even though they tried to make a run in the third, they then lost Jalen Brunson to a fractured hand halfway through the third. Rough. So it's just, yeah, it just was not meant to be. It just wasn't in the cards for the Knicks. The Pacers run away with this game seven in Madison Square Garden. And despite all the injuries, you do got to tip your cap. Winning a game seven at Madison Square Garden, even with injuries, like for a young team, which is exactly what the Pacers are. And it's really interesting looking at this group of final four and how many young stars are actually in this conference finals right now. You don't really have many of the old heads or they're all in, you know, secondary or tertiary roles that they have on their teams if they're going to be, you know, involved here. So it really is kind of that changing of the guard. Uh, but the Pacers get a pretty handily win game seven in Madison Square Garden. So that's going to be the Celtics opponent here. So we're looking Celtics Pacers Tuesday night at the TD Garden. Kari, you're going to be, are you going to be there for that one, Kari, uh, in the building? I I'm actually I'm taking that one off just because I'm I'm okay. down here and my flight is during the game. So <laughs> um, we, we gotta get someone to schedule you some better flights, man. <laughs> man, my dad booked this months ago and I <laughs> I didn't even know I'd be I'd be involved in this run. So well um, let's 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 start here then, Kari. This is gonna be so it's gonna be the Celtics and Pacers. Celtics actually went three and two versus the Pacers in the regular season. So the Pacers, you know, they're every every other team the Celtics have played so far. No, Jimmy. You, you know the list. I'm not even going to go through the damn list. You guys know who hasn't played in these first two series. Right. The Pacers are basically healthy, minus Benedict Matherin, but that's been so long, and they've, they've added Siakam since the, the Celtics and Pacers squared off in the regular season. But 3-2, Pacers did get the Celtics twice. What's your initial reaction to the Pacers being Celtics opponent here in the Eastern Conference Finals? Hey, if you like offense, this is the series for you. This is two of the top offenses in the NBA. I mean... Pacers are the highest scoring team in the league, not just in the postseason, but during the regular season. So, you know, they just got so many weapons and they're efficient with it. Like, you know, you know, I mean, we know about Halliburton already. You got a sweet shooting big and Miles Turner, you know, I mean, Neesmith is going to want to get his against the Celtics, you know, I mean, they were just bombing away from threes. I think at one point they were shooting for like most of the half. The first half, they were shooting like 80% from the field against the yeah. Knicks. I mean, like 76% at halftime is what is what it ended up being from the field. And what's crazy is they had such a size advantage that I thought they were just going to be bodying the Knicks, which they did some of that. Because, like, you know, you figure like Josh Hart was their leading rebounder this postseason, and he's 6'4", right? So you would think that it would just be bully ball inside. But Indy showed that they can shoot the lights out, and that's what they that's what they did against the Knicks. And, um, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see them matched up with Boston because everyone says, oh, Indy can't play defense. But I don't know. Playoff basketball is a little different. And, you know, we get to watch some high-level offensive basketball, gentlemen. We do. We do. And you mentioned defense. You mentioned uh, Miles Turner. And it, it's funny because, like, uh, one of my best friends down here in Austin, Texas, is from Indianapolis. Big Pacers fan. And he's so anti-Miles Turner. Really? Like it, it, it like kind of it, it's kind of changing my um kind of expectations going into this series because of how much he thinks Miles Turner is just like kind of a big sissy. That's like the way he describes him. Is okay. he's like he doesn't rebound, he he used to be a great shot blocker and now he's just like not blocking shots anymore. Um, I you know, you want your big to 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 kind of be a dog, and he's not a dog, he's just more of a finesse player. He's like so down on Miles Turner it's kind of shaped like kind of warped my perception of who their defense could be because he's on the back line. I'm um, not that I've been a huge miles Turner throughout my, 
you know, my, my basketball viewing experience of Miles Turner's career, but I, I just don't really expect the Pacers to be able to give us much on the defensive side of the ball. Um, the one guy that honestly worries me is Neesmith and McConnell, like <laughs> Neesmith and McConnell <laughs> are the two guys that I'm just like dreading playing right now. Halliburton's going to do Halliburton shit. He's going to be annoying to go up against because his shots broken and he somehow goes in. Um, but I think watching TJ McConnell be the best version of Peyton Pritchard in the series against Peyton Pritchard will break my heart <laughs> if he just outplays Peyton Pritchard. And then we have Neesmith for the Neesmith inevitable revenge game where he probably will hurt somebody on the Celtics. Let's just try and keep KP out of the game anytime he's Aaron Neesmith is in the game. Yeah, just just quickly, Kari, on some on what you were mentioning about the the Pacers hot shooting. So in the playoffs right now, they actually lead the playoffs. And I don't know if this has an update, but actually I don't think it would change it with the update of uh this uh nuggets and timberwolves game but they're leading the playoffs in field goal percentage from from the field and then also three point field goal percentage their field goal percentage for as a team is 50.7 38.1 from the three point line on about 34 35 attempts per game so they're they're certainly shooting the hell out of the ball when it comes to them coming into the series and miles turner is actually one of the guys leading the way he's shooting nearly 45 percent on about five and a half attempts and while we're all just giving our miles turner takes i've always been actually a little bit high on miles turner i do like miles I like turner i well so i i watched him in college out here at UT, I worked at UT at the time, working in the athletic department. So I went to every single college game for Miles Turner. And to this day, I will never forget. I will. I can't pick a Rick Barnes coach team because he misused that man so incredibly bad. It, it was it was just pathetic to watch Rick Barnes try to coach that <laughs> team. That team had so much more talent, did not use Miles Turner. I think they I think the stat was they ran a total of seven pick and rolls or pick and pops with him his entire year. And then in summer league, I think the Pacers ran 55 in summer league or something crazy. Like it was driving me nuts. But when you look at this, this Pacers team and Greg, I'm with you. Like, I think the Neesmith McConnell part is going to be fascinating to watch in the series. Cause I'm already ready for at least one game in the series that the Celtics will lose just based on hustle. Like those two are going to hustle the Pacers to a win in this series. I don't know what game. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I do think that the that the Pacers are going to have one game where they just out hustle the Celtics to a victory. But I think this team does really go as Halliburton goes. I know you kind of were somewhat dismissive of that, Greg. But when you look at him in this postseason, and especially watching this last series, when he's assertive, this team just just plays better like they're they're a real team like you can look at it when you look at his shots per game like his shot attempts like seven attempts in game one against the bucks they lost game one against the knicks six shot attempts they lost game six six or nine shot attempts they lost like this team really goes as halliburton decides to get involved or not involved and watching this Knicks series there were times where he just took himself out of the game i didn't really understand it so i don't know what's going on and then other games where he was very very aggressive so i think halliburton on the high end scale of what the pacers what type of trouble the pacers can give the celtics will probably determine that but i think game to game you're thinking correctly right and that it's going to be the nemhards the knee smiths and the mcconnells that are just going to become royal pains in the asses and i cannot wait to see the hate that TJ McConnell receives from the Boston fans. <laughs> well, here's my thing with Halliburton, because I'm not anti Halliburton. It's more of like, uh, it's kind of the same thing as the Anthony Edwards conversation, where the media is so quick to anoint some of the young guys, where like it kind of bothers me a little bit, where I'm like, they need to prove themselves a little bit more before we're just saying he's the next big thing. You know what I mean? And that we're saying he has arrived. Tyrese Halliburton's a good player. I, I would love to coach Tyrese Halliburton. I think he'd be a really fun player to coach as well. But like the the idea that Tyrese Halliburton just like had a spot on the Olympic team, like really kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Where I was like, yeah, he like I get it. He 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 can come in off the bench for that team and and change the tempo. He's a connector. He's he's long. He's athletic. Like I get it with Halliburton, but you really just like he's automatically on the team. Like there's no debate about all the other great young point guards in the league. It's just Halliburton who didn't even really play that well for Team USA in the in the in when when they got bronze, I think, in the, the last in the FIBA FIBA games. No, they, they lost to Canada. They didn't even get bronze. They didn't even get bronze. Yeah. So that that's my thing with Halliburton. It's like it's an overall just like idea that we we accept these young guys too early. Um, I want him to earn it a little bit more, and I hope the Celtics show him he's not ready for prime time yet. 
talking like a coach out there, Greg. <laughs> Want him to earn it. Want him to earn this spot. Hey, can we – one real quick point on the Olympics. How is Jalen feeling knowing that they picked Tatum and Drew? <laughs> <laughs> Over him. It's it, that's interesting to think about. I know the the one time and, and listen, all the Celtics were responsible for this because there was four Celtics on that team that finished what sixth in in FIBA before the before the last Olympics. Uh, but I don't think that was a glowing recommendation during that that, that stint for Jalen Brown on that Olympic team. Which I think actually Derek White was actually on that team. Before. No, that whoa, 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 hold on. I, I want to push that back team. on that. Why do you why do you say that it wasn't a glowing recommendation for Jalen just because of the team's lack of lack of success? Yeah, yeah, it's it's more other than Tatum, basically everyone from that Team USA is like not really a part of Team USA basketball. Anymore. Gotcha. Because I I actually think Jalen played really well for that team. They had him playing power forward and guarding like huge guys in in mm -hmm. Eurobasket. So I thought Jalen played really well, and I actually learned a lot about Jalen from watching that tournament because of the way that they utilized him as a power forward. Where I was like, oh, Jalen can really guard up better than I thought that he could, and you see that to this day, like the grown man strength. Kari, I got to ask you, because I haven't been, stood next to Jalen Brown. How how yoked is Jalen Brown? He looks like he's put on like another 15 pounds of muscle throughout the year. Oh, yeah. He's he's a big boy for sure. I mean, um, I don't know. We're about the same height. Obviously, he's way more cut than I am. Like, I would give him <laughs> I would give him like a solid like 6'6", six, six, like 230, you know? And that for for NBA, that's very NBA big. That's not like, mm -hmm. oh, my God, he's a linebacker big. But that's NBA big and strong. Yeah, yeah, so man. When you when, when you see him compared to like, is there is there like is there many guys that you look at that are like, you know, that that are play the same position as Jalen Brown that you would look at and be like, okay, that's one guy that actually stands out as being you know even bigger than Jalen, or does Jalen typically is he is he at the top of that that spectrum? I won't say this based on pure bigness, but for lower body strength and the ability to guard bigs when he really shouldn't be able to drew holiday drew guards actual yeah. bigs now like and that's one of the things that really impresses me about this game is like when they rotate down to the post and you got drew on a big he still can do a really good job like it's not even that much of a drop off when he's guarding big yeah it's interesting when you when you think bringing it back to the series with the pacers because Think about the matchups um, throughout the year. I know he he wasn't on the Pacers um, when we played them, but when we played Siakam, when Siakam was with the yeah. Raptors, that was Drew Holiday's assignment, right? And he didn't really do a good job against Siakam. It was like Siakam's game is so herky-jerky and so unorthodox that Drew just like kind of couldn't figure out the rhythm of, that, of how that goes. But I don't think that will be an issue because bringing it back to Jalen Brown's ability to guard up, he's always guarded Siakam really well. I would actually be interested – how much we're going to utilize Drew Holiday against Miles Turner. That would be the the cross match that I would be really interested in because there's no way Miles Turner is going to take advantage of Drew Holiday in the post to, to Kari's point <laughs> about Drew just being a beast. Like Drew's on that Lou Dort shit, you know what I mean? Right. And I don't think Miles Turner it would be ready to take advantage of that. What, what are your guys' thoughts on that? I mean, the, the thing, the concern about the matchup with Miles and Drew is that Miles can just turn and shoot over him. You know, like the length, the length disparity is so great. I mean, you're talking, you know, like 6'11 versus 6'4. So that's kind of the only thing. As far as embodying Drew and even like out rebounding him, I don't think that's the, much of a concern, but uh, it's a little bit too easy to shoot over him. You know what I mean? And and for me, it's not even from the post. It's you know, like we just mentioned, he's shooting forty five percent from three right now. Like he's not going to be bothered by a holiday contest. Then again, maybe that's the shot, depending on what the scheme is that that you're going to be okay living with, because holiday is going to be able to you know roam or do other things that are going to allow for that to be okay for the Celtics to live with. Um, but yeah, I, I think that will be interesting to see. I like that idea of a cross match, Greg. So I'm interested to see. That's that's one of the great things about all these new series. We get to see what those matchups are, are going to be and so you know i guess while we're on this topic you know who do you think let, let's let's talk about the stars of the pacers let's go to siakam who you just brought up greg and halliburton when you look at them it sounds like you think jalen's likely to get the siakam call who do you think gets the halliburton call well can, can i pause real quick because i want to talk about cross matches just as like a, 
um, an ad- a competitive advantage, which is something that I think the Celtics have done a really good job with throughout the year. It's just like watching it as much as I can from a coach's perspective because I, I it's tough to turn the fan brain off. I love the idea of starting out in cross matches because – when when we play great defense and we get in transition, oftentimes that leads to a mismatch on the other side of the court. And I think the Celtics do a really good job exploiting those cross matches in transition. And I think that's part of their their game plan that they don't that's not really talked about a lot is how much it unlocks things for the Celtics offense because we're so unorthodox with our matchups on defense. But when when you think about the Pacers lineup, so they go Halliburton, Nemhard, Neesmith, Siakam, and Turner, right? They've got three like size guards with Halliburton, Nemhart, and Neesmith. You got Siakam, who's 6'8, 6'9, and Turner, who's a seven foot finesse big. So, one thing that I really like about our ability to guard that matchup is I think we maybe Derek White can't handle Miles Turner because Derek White kind of gets exploited a little bit when he when he gets posted up. But I think we could probably switch one through five against that team. And I'm trying, I'm just trying to think of Al Horford, right? Because he's going to be starting at the five with Chris Stapp still out. What makes the most sense for Horford? He can't guard Halliburton. He probably shouldn't guard Nemhard because, you know, that Joe likes to get really experimental with some stuff. Nemhard's too crafty of a playmaker and too consistent as a shooter. Neesmith is the one guy that I could see um, Joe maybe trying to mess around there. But I I think what's going to end up happening is we're going to be pretty conventional to start. Actually, I think you'll see Al Horford on Miles Turner. You'll see Jalen Brown on Pascal Siakam. I think you'll see Jason Tatum either guarding Halliburton or Nemhard, and then you'll have um, probably Drew. Drew would get one of them, and I think Derek White would probably start on Neesmith. Smith. But who knows, man? There's there, there's a lot of different ways that you can go with it. I I don't know what the one thing. Because with with matchups, you always want to try and take away something from that mm-hmm. offense, and they're a pretty equal opportunity offense with the Pacers. So, um, yeah, that that's my first thought. What do you what do you got, Damian? I mean, I like your idea of the cross match of like how it uh, how it affects the offense, right? Because as you were going through that, I'm thinking, man, like who's going to end up on Tatum and Jalen from the from this, right? Because if you know if if Tatum's guarding Halliburton or Nemhard or Neesmith, like I'm very okay with all of that happening, you know, if that's who Tatum's matched up with and Tatum's been really, really good. So one of the things that happened in these Pacers games early in the season, and this was we out without Siakam. So we'll have to see how that changes things. But Jason Tatum was really, really good in those games. In fact, he actually averaged uh, 32 and a half points, 11 rebounds, 5.8 assists, shot over 50% from the field in all those games. So Tatum's been having a great postseason, but he hasn't shot the ball well. He shot 43% from the field, 28% from the three-point line. So this is also the potential, as you're saying, Greg, with how the defensive matchups affect the offensive matchups. This potentially could be kind of the springboard that Jason Tatum needs to actually get that those shot percentages back up to go along with everything else that he's done so well. And Because you know Neesmith, Neesmith, that's Neesmith's assignment. He's going to cover Tatum. Right. But if but if Tatum to your I think what you're saying, if he's covering Halliburton, maybe we get more opportunities where Tatum is matched up in transition against Halliburton and really get him going early. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's that's what I think is gonna be the most fascinating part for me. So I I I love that idea. What about you, Kari? Um, you know, I agree with Greg that it's probably best to go conventional to start this one. Um, I think you made a really good point there. Um as far as just the matchups. What I like about the Celtics is they have the versatility to throw waves of guys at people. So if there's a hot hand, you know, give them a little bit and you can switch up the field too. You know, you can, you can get a little bit more of a physical feel with Jalen. You can, you know, throw Drew Drew on, you know, whoever has the hot hand for a couple of possessions. And uh, you know, I just like how they have the ability to mix and match on defense. Cause usually they don't, they don't usually keep a guy on a guy start to finish. They usually try to mix things up, give a couple different looks and on defense and coverages. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's a good thing that'll work in Boston's favor. So let me ask you this, guys. We're, we're, we're talking through this right now. We're talking a lot about, you know, Indiana's offense, the, the way that they're shooting the ball right now. Are we ready to, to, to give some some predictions here of what, what we think this series is going gonna, is gonna to turn out like? Are we, are we ready to do that? Or is there another point that we haven't got to yet? Let's go. 
Yeah, why don't you go first, Will? You're, you're always asking. Right, let's go, Will. Let's go, Will. <laughs> so let's turn all it on all right, you. you what you, what Will's up? pick. Will's pick. I got Celtics in five. I already said it before. Oh. Celtics are going to lose one game. I'm, I might as well. You know what? Based on the way that this postseason has gone, let's bookmark it as game two. Celtics are just going <laughs> to lose one game based on hustle, effort, the Neesmith, McConnell, Nemhard, um, you know, you can even throw, you know, I, I, Isaiah Jackson in there, who I thought was was actually pretty pretty impressive with his athleticism in that Knicks series. Like, I think just one game, everything's going to click. The Pacers offense is going to hit a bunch of threes. They're going to outwork the Celtics. Celtics are going to have an off night, whatever. That's going to happen. But as we just talked about with some of those matchups defensively for the Pacers, I just don't see a world in which they're going to be able to slow down the Celtics unless the Celtics are doing it to themselves. I, there's so much versatility to the point that you just mentioned, Kari, that whether it's defensively or offensively, they can attack you in multiple ways offensively. And then defensively, if something's not working, they have plenty of options to keep the same framework of what they want to do, but switch Drew for Jalen, switch Jalen for Derek White, move in and out of these different looks. And it's really hard for me to imagine a world in which the Pacers are able to, especially with how young they are. And I think Siakam being there does make a difference. Like that is going to be something that that does help them in this series. We've seen Siakam have both sides of the coin against the Celtics where he's had, he's had some moments and he's had some really bad moments as well too. So I don't know how that's going to play out, but ultimately I think the Celtics just have too much with or without Porzingis. We know, by the way, we're without Porzingis for the first two games. He's already been ruled out. We'll see what that looks like. Kari, if you got any insights on that, make yeah. sure you let us know. Let us know how KP's looking. But, yeah, I got Celtics in five. I think it's 4-1. There's a world in which this gets to six. But uh, I think it's a 4-1 Celtics gentleman sweep. Let's go to let's go to you, Kari. You're the guest. I'll put you on the hot seat next. Okay, real quick about KP. I did see him in Cleveland, um, you know, right before – uh, game four, which obviously is a while ago now, but you know, he's at the point where he's back on the court and he's doing more than just jogging around. Like he's, he's, he's working on, you know, some fadeaways out of the post, you know, he's working on sliding out of pick and rolls. It was kind of ginger. It wasn't a hundred percent. He wasn't going completely hard, but he's kind of at that point, you know, and probably a little bit past that now where he's starting to take some basketball actions. Um, in addition to, you know, he was on the stationary bike at practice, you know, according to a lot of the reports. So, you know, he's been working on that conditioning. As far as my actual pick, uh, give me Celtics and six, you know, just because I'll believe it when I see it when it comes to that killer instinct from the Jays. Like, I, I, we have no evidence that they're going to that they're going to actually handle this team as easily as people, you know, think that they will. And, you know. Both series have been in five. You're telling me Indy's not one game better than the Cavs without Donovan Mitchell? I mean, come on. This the Celtics are in for way more of a fight than I think than I think you know Will thinks they are. Greg, you well, have the floor. It's interesting, man. It really is interesting. I was I was actually <laughs> I was actually thinking like, how much better is this Pacers team, just player for player? than what we just saw with Cleveland, what we just saw with Miami. But then also juxtapose that with how much better are the Celtics versus what the Pacers <laughs> just dealt with with the Knicks when there was a lineup that the, the Knicks threw out there, I think, in game six. And the Bucks, where, by the way. Let's just throw the Bucks in there as well, too. Like, that's right. what their their path was. So Right. With Deuce McBride, Precious Achua, um, Isaiah Hartenstein, Alec Burks, and I forget who the last guy was, but it wasn't anybody good. And I was, <laughs> as I'm watching that, I'm like, damn, these Knicks are 100% heart. That's, that's what they are. Like, they don't have a lot of talent. And when you go from that team against this Celtics team that is an absolute buzzsaw in terms of talent, I think game one, Celtics will probably blow out the Pacers coming off a of game seven. One thing to make note of, though, Halliburton didn't play the entire fourth quarter because the game was well in hand. So he mm -hmm. should be pretty well rested for that game one, um, which I thought was an interesting storyline to come out of that. But I think the Celtics handle their business in game one and make a statement. But then to Will's point, game two, will they understand that just because <laughs> they won game one does not mean that the series is over. How many wake ups call do you how many wake up calls do you need in a postseason? Hopefully they're looking across the Western Conference and they're saying, oh, man, Jokic is out. 
He's yeah. not there anymore. The one guy that we probably had no answer for. Like we really have a chance mm-hmm. to just get our shit done. Right. We don't want to have to bring KP into this series at all. Let's handle our business. Let's take care of these Pacers in five games, win both games at home, give them one in Indiana, finish it off game five in the garden. That's really what I see with this team. I just don't think the Pacers have enough on the defensive side of the ball to have anything for the Celtics. Halliburton can get exposed by Drew in the post. Nemhart can get exposed by, by Jalen in the post. Neesmith can only guard one person. Siakam is a good team defender. I wouldn't call him a great individual defender by, by any means. Miles Turner, as you, as, as I told you earlier, is a pansy according to Indiana Pacers fans. <laughs> the one guy that, that scares me a little bit off the bench, Will, you mentioned him, Jackson. I think Jackson could be um, an X factor for them just with his, his um, athleticism and shot blocking ability. But I'm just thinking about the Celtics and I'm like, Sam Hauser can probably get off in the series. They don't, they don't really have a way to play Sam Hauser off the court. They don't have a way to play Peyton Pritchard off the court. They don't have a way to even play Luke Cornett off the court, really. So I think the, the Celtics are just a tough matchup for the Pacers. That offense is something to behold with the Pacers, the way that they play. But I think I got Celtics in five. Um, I don't buy the bullshit of the uh, the Jays don't have killer instinct, Kari. <laughs> Kari, hold on. Let me, let, let me ask you this real quick, Kari. Right. If Let's if go. OG doesn't go down for the Knicks, what do you think? What do you think would have happened in that series? I mean, I think the Knicks would have closed it out. Um, you know, I mean, they, they clearly missed him <laughs> today. Yeah, like, you know, they missed him a lot. And I, I respect to him for trying to go out there and make it happen. And like Greg mentioned earlier, he did hit those couple shots, and I was like, "Oh, okay, OG." <laughs> but then, you know, obviously, he couldn't really move after that, and then. Yeah, look, he had a gunshot wound after he like hit that one yeah. shot in the corner, and I was like, "Oh, bro, you can't even get back to half court. Never mind trying to guard somebody out here. Like this just isn't." I'm glad happen. they took him off the court. I I texted yeah. our 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 Knicks friend, um, and I was just like, "Man, like I hope they save him from himself because he's yeah. gonna get seriously injured." Contract. He's coming up in free agency too. The man's man's about to get get paid out here. So, uh, I think it's listen. I I, I I'm trying not to disrespect the Pacers. But at the same time, you know, I, I think this will actually be good. This is what I think will be good for the Celtics. This team is not injured, right? This basic, this team is fully healthy. So there's no way that they should be able to say, oh, there's no Jimmy Butler. There's no right. Terry Rozier. There's no Jared Allen. There's no Don. You can't say that, at least as of right now. Like all the Pacers, as presently constituted, they're there. They're there and playing. You have their full strength. Of, of what they're going to throw at you. So that part of the Celtics letting down their guard shouldn't be there. You know, to Greg's point, we'll see. Cause I think game one, they're going to hand, they're going to, they're going to take care of business, but then we've seen that letdown in game two and two series. So, you know, maybe history will repeat itself. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I just, I just think the Celtics have too much for the Pacers, man. I just, it's hard for me. If this gets to six, like I said, I think it's not impossible, but I think it's tough for this, this series to, to get the six, but well, they do have too much on paper. <laughs> <laughs> on paper, that's all we need. <laughs> on that's paper. They have too much. Well, he, here's the thing I just want to like give the listeners and Kari and Wilkes. Well, I don't think I've ever told you the story either. Just like my mindset as a coach. And Will, you you've played with me in our men's league team. I'm a pretty feisty competitor. I talk a lot of shit. I I you as you said, I yell out some primal, some primal yells yeah. randomly at times. I, I'm, yeah, I'm that, uh... pretty crazy. So like when I when I was a coach, in terms of like killer instinct, and I don't necessarily know that this is a good thing, a lesson to be teaching kids or whatever. But I was a, I was a varsity coach down here in Texas, and there was a senior night game where we were playing the other team on their senior night. And they're all having these great moments with their parents and whatnot. And I gather my team as, as all this stuff is going on. And I say to every single one of those kids, and I said, I want all these pictures to be fucking ruined by the end of the night. I want these kids to go home in tears. I want their parents to be like holding their head. I, I want to ruin their senior night. Like they think this is a night they're never going to forget. Well, let's fucking give them a night they're never going to forget. You know what I mean? Like that's the type of coach that I was like, I was like really, really intense. So we, you know, when I, when I see the Pacers, I think that's the mindset that I have. I'm like, the Celtics are just going to run them out of the freaking building. They're just going to kill them. They're going to smoke. Them. I, it doesn't really happen with this team, but yeah. I, I always view it like kind of how, how I just like compete 
as a as a person and, and as a player and i think it comes through in the way that i predict series so i might be wrong with the the celtics in five um kari so i i will give you that i mean you very well could be right because on talent like they should but just like so taking your story into account greg is that the vibe you get from jason tatum at all when you listen to him talk no he's not <laughs> he's not a rip your heart out i'm gonna go kobe mode type of guy Jason Which is ironic because very... Kobe's his favorite player, but yeah. Exactly, but he's just not wired that way. Tatum is very even keeled. He's the one that says, you know, it's one loss, guys. It doesn't mean anything. We're going to come get the next one. Like, he's that type of guy. So, like, it's just the opposite of the vibes. And, and it comes through in the way they play. Because as we saw with Miami last year, sometimes they don't take inferior teams seriously. and. Mm-hmm. It's one of the things that kills me about watching this team. Like, they're a great team. Love watching them. They're the best team in the league. I'll give them all the props. But they are very frustrating because they do have these games where you're like, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, it's, it's game two history. against the Cavs. What are you doing? Yeah. Like, we're we're going to have at least one moment, if not two, in this series. So I'm already prepared for that. So we'll see because I, I think a lot of what you're saying is true. It's just a matter of I, I think the talent gap is too big in this series for it to matter too much. Whereas yeah. with Miami last year and in other series, it will bite you in the ass. And if they should make the finals, that's where it uh, it could get interesting. But before we go over and take a look at the the Western Conference here for a moment, Greg, I got to ask you: Did you guys win the game? Oh yeah, we killed them. Ah. All right, so so it, it worked. So there yeah. we go. <laughs> <laughs> full court press, full court trap, the whole game. We were up by like, I think we were up like 30. This is very Joe Missoula of you, by the way. Yeah. This, this, this feels like yeah. Joe Missoula's mentality. Yeah, but I, I do it with like expression on my face. Joe Missoula is terrifying because he does it with just like a stone face <laughs> the entire time. That's why Joe Missoula scares the hell out of me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, Drew Holiday was talking about today. He's crazy. He's legitimately crazy. And I think we we all know that now. But let's uh, all right. Let's head over to the Western Conference Finals here for a few minutes before we wrap this pod up. Uh, you know, we started this talking with Game Seven between the Nuggets and T Wolves. T Wolves pull off the stunner, get the get the win on the road in Game Seven, uh, and then the night before Saturday night, you got Luca Kyrie in the Mavs. Uh, just an absolute thriller against the Thunder. They take that series 4-2. So now we've got Mavs and T-Wolves. And Kari, I'm going to start this f- going from the game tonight because I was telling Greg this before you hopped on. And I even asked on Twitter, you know, who are Celtics fans rooting for? Because a lot, a lot, of, and I don't want to discredit the match. I think the Mavs could certainly come out of the series, but it kind of felt like Nuggets T Wolves might be one of those times where in NBA history, sometimes it just lines up where, oh yeah, that second round matchup felt like the conference finals, and maybe that will be the case. Maybe it won't be. Luke is on the other side, so you never know. You can't, you can't write off the Mavs. But I was curious to know who Celtics fans were rooting for. And overwhelmingly on Twitter, I forget what the exact number was, but it was basically like 70, 30 people are rooting for the Wolves over the Nuggets. And Greg mentioned it as well, too. Like, we don't have a way to solve Jokic, I don't think. And I think one of the one of the things that we've been trying to figure out with the Celtics team is that I think their identity is steeped in their versatility, which is something that you brought up earlier. And I think the way that the Celtics could potentially match up with a Wolves or even the Mavs, I think that works out really well for the Celtics, as long as, to your point, they play down to their competition. They also play up to their competition as well. And I think those two teams are not going to allow for them to drop down their level of of competition. So I think the Wolves beating the Nuggets was actually a really, really positive step towards, if you're looking at the Celtics for Banner 18, I think this is a really positive step that it's going to be Wolves, Mavs, and not Nuggets, Mavs. So when you look at, you know, Wolves and Mavs, Who do you think has the edge in that series, Kari? I am going to take Minnesota. I just think they're the more complete team. I mean, I think their bigs are better. Um, I think that'll be key. Um, I think that Ant is going to do his thing and get his Mike Conley, savvy vet, been there. I mean, I just like the balance of their team, and I think that a well-balanced squad like them is going to take out the two stars that Dallas has. Yeah, it's you know it's it's really interesting when when you see the way that the T Wolves defend, right? Where people are talking about them as an all time great defense, and I would second that. I do think that the 
the length that they can throw out there where they can put out like a all six ten lineup and not have an issue with it. Like they're they're really special on the defensive side of the ball. Nas Reed, oh my God. Was he Two massive blocks in this on Jokic game. at the end of the game today? He I mean and when Cat went out with five fouls, he really stepped up. I mean, he went he took over the game for a three minute stretch when when they needed somebody to step up. And when you think about what the the Mavs have with Luka Doncic, who I think could actually have a better series than he just had um, against Lou Dort going up against Jaden McDaniels. I think Luka does so well when he's able to use his physicality and Lou Dort's one of the few defenders in the league that can like almost out physical Luka. So Jaden McDaniels can do a really good job against Luka. Luka has struggled against like Andrew Wiggins in the past and things of that nature. So um, it should be interesting to see the point of attack and how they're able to um, guard Luca with Jaden, but I think Luca can get Jaden McDaniels in foul trouble because um, he's not the most um, disciplined defender. And then when you think about Nikhil Alexander Walker and how he had a pretty big impact on the series against Jamal Murray, Luca would toast him. Luca is going to just take him in the post and, and just work him to death. So then you, when you think about the other guys that they might be able to throw at him, maybe that's a Nas Reed matchup. Maybe Nas Reed tries to take Luca. Maybe that's um, Kyle Anderson, you know, just yeah. playing slow mo against slow mo. <laughs> D cell steps against slow mo. <laughs> who, who knows what's going to happen there? But I, I think the T Wolves. I think this is their year, man. Cat really impressed me, even though he does his dumb cat shit. He was really impressive in that. Real thing, quick, that Kari, I know you didn't see this. How funny was Cat running up and down the baseline trying to get the ball in <laughs> with like a minute? There's like a minute left. I think the Wolves are up nine, maybe at this point or something, something to that effect. And they still have two timeouts. And Cat <laughs> takes the ball out of bounds after a made basket and is just running up and down, like just, just like pan <laughs> in a complete panic. <laughs> and then tosses the ball in and it goes off of like Anthony Edwards was covered and he just like threw it up because he thought he's going to get a five second violation. It was, I, I need someone to just clip just him running up and down the sideline because it was, hysterical. it should be all the good he did, but it's, it should oh, be it's, a it's so good. So yeah, but Cat was so impressive in that series, man. Um, where like I'm almost starting to believe in him, and I'm not a big Car Anthony Towns guy at all. Um, where do you find that, thought... Kari? Yeah, oh, I... on, on Cat's game, just just not even just tonight, but just in general. What, what are your thoughts on Cat? I mean, I like his game, like you know, I, I, he's just a very versatile big, like he, he can score in a variety of ways. I think he's you know, above average defender, and like you can you can space the floor and hit some threes. He takes more threes than I would like him to take, but like he has the ability to 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 knock those types of shots down. I mean, there's not too many things on the floor that he can't do, which is why I like his game. Kari, I have to ask you. So, do you, as a big guy, because if you if those listeners don't know, Kari's like six 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 seven, and he's been six six since he was twelve years old. Um, <laughs> <Literally>. <laughs> Slightly less yoked than uh, Jalen Brown, as we learned. Yeah. yeah. A little, so, a little chubbier, a little chubbier if we being real. Slightly less young. You know, that's when why I'm you, jump rope king. When you watch it, jump rope king. When you watch, I'll retell that story uh, another time when you come on for those that uh, that missed that the first three times I told it. Um, but <laughs> when you watch big guys, do you watch them through a lens of like, oh, like I wanted to be a guy. I wanted to be a big guy like you. Is that why you enjoy watching Cat? Well, no, because like I – when I watch big guys, I watch big guys with no bounce because that was my game. So I was like, who are the big <laughs> wide bodies that can just move people? Oh, so you must love Tillman. Uh, yeah, I like <laughs> Tillman's game. I like Tillman's game. You know, I was a big Jared Sullinger guy. You know, like Sully, those, those are my types of guys, man. Like, you know, the, those, you know, big baby, like, you know. <laughs> yeah, rough days so, for big baby. I'll say that. Uh, yeah, I, obviously it's <laughs> a player. Not as a person, but like, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, you know, big body Celtics. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what was that? Danny Fortson. Remember Danny Fortson? Yeah, I remember Danny Fortson. Danny Fortson, back Fortson in the day. Pacer, yeah. Offensive rebound and king. Um, okay. Well, Will, when, when you think about the Western Conference, who do you, who would you rather the Celtics play? Would it's this easy answer, Mavs? You'd rather Celtics play the Mavs? Is it that easy? Yeah, I think I think it's the easy answer is the Mavs. I just think they have less options. Like the biggest thing I would I'm concerned about for them is like you said, Greg. I think in that T Wolf series, like it's it's really gonna go as Luca goes, I think, for a good portion of it, because he's just gonna have a better matchup than he did against Lou Dort. And then the other part of it is they're getting, you know, 
each night, whether it's PJ Washington or Derek Jones, or it's a rookie in Derek live, like they're getting these really tough performances out of, out of guys that you're kind of not expecting them to continue to replicate. And so, you know, they got away with two games in the Thunder series where Kyrie didn't break 10 points like against Minnesota or Boston. I don't think that's something the Mavs can, can get away with and survive. So I, I just don't think the Mavs have enough options. Whereas, you know, the wolves, like we talked about, like, they're that's a loaded defense. They're really big. Greg, you mentioned like the Pacers don't have a way to shorten the Celtics rotation and play people out. The Wolves do. The Wolves have a way to make the, the Celtics kind of condense their rotation. And, you know, we don't know where Chris Stapps Porzingis is going to be, but he will be absolutely instrumental in a series against the against the Timberwolves against the Mavs. Still definitely going to be nice to have a KP. I think there's a world in which if the Mavs, you know, if it was the Mavs Celtics and we still didn't have KP or the full version of KP, I still think the Celtics would be probably my pick in that series. So between the Mavs and T-Wolves, I would lean Mavs. But when you got a guy like Luca and, you know, Kyrie in Boston, we don't, we, we know that's, you know, that doesn't really mix too well. So I don't know how much we want to deal with that. And I still think about that left-handed hook shot that he hit earlier this year. Still, maybe the craziest shot I've I've ever seen. Like, blows my mind. He really we struggled to and, finish. He struggled to finish against the Thunder. He did. He did. So that's what I'm saying. Like, I mean, he's also another one of those X factors. But we know that he can go off in a big spot. Is kind of you know where I was ending at. So you can't discount. But I think Mavs over T Wolves would be from a competitive standpoint who I would want for for the Celtics. How about you, Kari? Well, I want the Mavs just for the fact that I want to see Kyrie back here for the finals. I mean, like. <laughs> You know, you want the spice, you want all of it. I mean, it's great coverage for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all the drama, and you know, like get these hater Boston fans all riled up. You know what I mean? Like they they have this irrational hate for Kyrie. You know, it's just like insane. Like I don't know, man. I maybe I don't value Lucky the Leprechaun as much as <laughs> other people do, but like, come on, like <laughs> it's just, it's kind of reached ridiculous levels. So I think that would be really fun. Um, as far as the actual matchup, I agree. I just think. Minnie's balance makes them a much tougher matchup. Yeah. I think just the Dallas is just so much more one sided. Like, what do they really have beyond Luca and Kyrie? Like, that's two great options. But like, mm -hmm. when you have a team that's as balanced as deep as the Celtics are, I think that they can give Minnesota, or they can give Dallas all types of problems. Yeah. yeah Quickly, let's get let's get predictions on this real quick from you guys here. We we'll start with you, Greg. Uh, who do I think is going to win? Yeah. Oh, Minnesota. Yeah, I, I picked Minnesota to beat Denver. I picked Minnesota to make it to the finals. So, uh, How many games? Seven. I think they'll need all seven. Kari, what about you? Mini and six. Mini and six? Yeah, I, I think that's kind of where I'm at as well, too. I think Minnesota and six. I think yeah, the Mavs, like I said, the Mavs are just going to be kind of go – as Luca goes, I think so. Minnesota just too much depth, too much versatility for for what the Mavs can can offer. Uh, but listen, every other night now we got conference finals starting on Tuesday, so we got a lot of basketball ahead of us. Uh, Kari, one one thing I actually wanted to ask you before we we wrap up here, you know, one of the th one of the storylines that has been building up a little bit for the Celtics has been the the home crowd that the crowd hasn't quite been as into it as in past years. What, what's your thoughts? Because you're actually in the building for this. I'm just seeing this on Twitter through a handful of people in the building or people in the media that have that have mentioned this. Do you think that the crowd hasn't quite been up to par with, with what we've gotten in past years from Celtics home crowds? Well, I'll compare it to Cleveland because I've been to both. Cleveland's crowd was way more rocking, way more fun, way more loud, way more intense. They had rally towels. People were up on their feet. They had this loud, obnoxious DJ that was just pumping in all types of crazy music. They had like, you know, they had their mascot beating up leprechauns. Like it was so much more <laughs> of a fun atmosphere than it brought out Miles Garrett to get the crowd pumped up. Like, you know, like TD Garden tickets are too expensive, man. I don't think the real fans can really afford tickets like that, dude. Like, cost you like a hundred bucks to get it's like a rich man sport in boston you know like you know you see it with the bruins too bruins don't have much of a home court advantage at td garden either it's lost game six at home like you know like i can't put that on you know the celtics per se i just think that just boston got to find a way to 
to to get some other type of people in here, man. <laughs> people all sitting down and like enjoying the game. Like it's not a rowdy, raucous atmosphere. Right. Like that. Yeah, I mean it's it's a trend that like, I've heard more and more of this during this during this run this season that people have been saying. I saw, you know, like even Donnie Wahlberg, who you know, obviously that's part of the you know elites. Celtics fans from a you know where, where he's sitting down the court side and stuff but like trying to make pleas on NBC Sports Boston the pregame shows that we got to be louder we got to be better but to your point maybe that's part of it because you know Boston is one of those towns where but then again you look at New York those tickets they had the most expensive game seven ticket of all yeah. time uh today I think it was like a $650 get in when they don't even have half their guys and it's still that type of that crowd, that crowd never doesn't show up. So but, as much as it's expensive, I think Boston's this is this is anybody that's going to the games, listen to this. We gotta show the fuck up. We gotta show the fuck up now because then in the finals is when we're really gonna need it even more against whether it's Minnesota or Dallas. Like the home court needs to be an advantage. And so yeah, the Celtics gotta play up to it and stop losing home games, but the fans also gotta make sure they're bringing it as well. Good point. But you guys both know this. New Yorkers have that extra level of ego. Rich or poor. <laughs> that's just a New York thing. They all think New York's the greatest. Like, you that know, like true. that's just that's just part of the psyche there. It's just interesting. Yeah, I think with the with the home crowd, I've said this before, but I even dating back to the KG era, with this the Celtics crowd, they don't just like always like give the players something the players first need to give them something before mm -hmm. the crowd reciprocates. I think like there are moments where the crowd is great, but just one thing that's always bothered me about TD garden in general is like how um, reliant the crowd can be on that fake noise meter. Yeah. Where I'm like, you really need that fake noise meter to, to get you hype to make noise. Like, let's just let's just get hype. I mean, you heard the way that I coach. That's how I'm a fan, too. I'm yeah. like, I'm standing on the chair. I'm screaming. I'm yelling out defense. I'm talking shit. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think, you know, maybe all the real fans are just podcasting now. Hey, <laughs> that could be it. We're behind the mic instead of in the stands. <laughs> there, we go. there we go. Oh, man. Well, we'll have to see, man. I'm excited. Eastern Conference Finals tips off on Tuesday night. Celtics Pacers, it is a every other night. So we'll hopefully be able to check in with our guy, Kari, uh, maybe either later in the series or at the end of the series as he's going to be busy at the TD Garden. And then I'm assuming you're, you're going to be on the road in, in India as well? We'll see. We'll see. we got to see how the finances are looking, man. Got to get a, okay. <laughs> you know. We'll check gotta, in gotta with Boston.com, see, see if they, see, see if they can get yeah. you on some good flights out there. <laughs> well, here's, sure the you get the here's the thing. So flights are crazy to Indy because the, the Indy 500, is going to be in the set in town mm. the same time as the Celtics. So like, I saw someone tweet about this. And they were like, "Why are flights nine hundred dollars to get to Indianapolis?" So yeah, I guess maybe so, that's part of it. Since I'm the third guy, like backing up Gary and Adam, like you know, obviously they're going to get priority over me. But we'll mm -hmm. see. There's no, <laughs> there's no like decisions been made yet or anything. All right. Well, we'll have to see. And Kari, we appreciate you joining us today. And we'll be checking in with you uh, throughout the end of the playoff run here. But that's going to do it for this episode here of Green with Envy. So as always, appreciate you guys checking in with us. Make sure you follow us on social media. Make sure you're following Kari on social media, following his work at Boston.com. Make sure you're locked into the YouTube channel. Greg and I will be back with a post-game podcast after game one on Tuesday night. And then, as always, we'll have our live stream on Thursday, 5 p.m. Eastern. 4 p.m. Central, Celtics Pacers, time to get it done. Put up or shut up. Let's get it. Eastern Conference Finals. We'll catch y'all later. Every time I get this high, I lose my mind. It don't take much no more. Until I hit the floor. Every time I get this high, it's you I find. It don't take much no more Until I'm at your door You cut me to my core, baby what can I say? You got me on the floor, you know I came to play. I know I shouldn't, but you seem to take my pain away. And every time I score, Jason Tatum fade away. I close my eyes and I'm floating your river. I call to see if you open. You know I hope you deliver every time.